your glory in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Well, I've met quite a few rebels throughout my life. How about you? Rebels. You know the type, don't you? They, they're just a little bit different. I don't know why I'm looking at Phil right now. He's, 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 he's different. You know, these guys, these gals, they might maybe dress a little bit different. Maybe they speak a little bit different. Just different. Rebels. I've always, I've always had like, I don't know, affinity towards rebels. I don't know, maybe it's because I, I feel like I've been one really my whole life. I don't really like fitting into the mold. Anybody, where are my rebels at? Come on. We got like half, half the crowd. The rest of y'all just conform. You just, you just follow. follow. Um, when I was studying this week, I, I kept on thinking about rebels. And I, there's some rebels, I think, that are rebels out of insecurity. And they're dying for attention or acceptance. And so they'll color their hair different or wear different coats or whatever. And, and it's, and I'm not looking at you on this. I'm sorry. Uh, no, Phil, what I love about Phil, this is actually perfect for my illustration because some people, it's out of insecurity. Some people are just secure in their identity and they know who they are. They're comfortable in their own skin. I, I remember Dennis Rodman, one of my favorite basketball players of all time. And you could love him or hate him, and typically you did. I loved the guy. The dude was a baller. The dude could rebound, always had a different hair color, million tattoos, nose pierces. I just loved the guy. Now, tragically, there, you know, he probably was some stuff, you know, disconnected from God and God's best. And, but I look. Then there's some people comfortable in their own skin and they're rebels. So you have rebels without a cause <laughs> and then you got rebels with a cause. And as I was preparing for this message, that, that was the title God gave me, Rebel with a Cause. And we're gonna take a look at a rebel with a cause today and his name is John the Baptist. Did you guys study this in Matthew 3? <laughs> Just Was it yesterday or the day before? And Johnny the Baptist, one of my favorite characters in the Bible. How many appreciate this guy? This dude is wild. I mean, he wore like camel hair, like coarse camel hair clothing, and then like a, like a leather belt that would wrap around. Dude lived out in the wilderness. His diet, you guys know what he ate? The dude ate locust and wild honey. We're my vegans in the house, right? Y'all natural eaters. That's Johnny the Baptizer. And John the Baptist was predicted and prophesied that he would come and really be the forerunner of Christ. This was predicted by Isaiah the prophet, chapter 40, verse three. Um, the last Old Testament book, Malachi, there was a prediction that John the Baptist would come and he would prepare the way for Jesus to enter in. You remember the story of, of how, you know, John, his parents were uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth. You remember that? And they were old folks, stricken in years, barren. And one time Zechariah was, his, so John the Baptist's dad, Zechariah, was a priest. And one time he was serving in the temple and the angel Gabriel came to him. He's like, yo, I know you're old and stuff, but I'm going to bless you with a, with a baby boy and you're to name him John. And you remember, and Zechariah was like, what? And he didn't believe the angel. I don't know about you, but if an angel like showed up and like said something to me, I'd be like, yo, whatever you say, I'd believe it. He didn't believe it. And because of it, like God made him mute until John the Baptist was born. And you know, he's writing with like a tablet. His name should be John, all this kind of stuff. So you'll, you'll study this if you haven't figured it out. But John the Baptist, revolutionary, rebel, revivalist, didn't care what people thought, comfortable in his own skin or camel skin, I should say. And, and I just love, I, I love what we can learn about this guy. And I'm, there, there's a few things that I want to talk about. Let's just get into the text. I'm sorry. I'm, y'all are like, can you get into the Bible? Right? All right, I'm in. You ready? Oh, wait, I forgot to give you this verse. This is really cool. <laughs> Sorry. No, this is cool. Uh, 
Look at this, Matthew eleven eleven. This is pretty wild. This is Jesus talking about Johnny the baptizer. Here's what he says. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there's not risen one greater than John the Baptist. I mean, if that's coming from Jesus, like the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, God in human flesh, he's saying Johnny's my, my guy, number one. Let's, we probably should listen to this guy. So let's take a look at it. Chapter three, verse one. In those days, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, look at verse two. Look at his message. Repent. <laughs> Is there any other message, by the way? Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Verse three, the prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, he is a voice. And I love that. Jesus in the Bible is called the word. So John is just the voice carrying the word. He's, he's just the messenger carrying the message. He's a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. So a couple of things real quick. Let's just pause real quick on that. What's his number one message? Repent. And let me give you another verse in Matthew. So the very next chapter, Matthew 4, verse 17. So that's John the Baptist's message. What was Jesus's first message? You remember that? Matthew 4, 17, from, from then on Jesus began to preach. What was Jesus' first word? Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So when I was studying this, I'm like, if G that was Jesus' first message, and that was John's only message, I would say the church better make sure that we keep that the message. So when I look in the mirror every day, and I'm like, God, Todd, repent. <laughs> Why? Because I look at God and I'm like, God is perfect. He's holy. He's got the perfect plan for me. And if I'm not fully submitted to his best plan, I'm cheating myself and dishonoring God. I need to turn from Todd's way and go to God's way. It's, it's, it's a simple message of repentance. And then he says this, prepare the way. So, so Johnny the baptizer, repent. Prepare the way for the Lord and clear the road. Now, let me give you a little context. So in that day, when a town would know that there would be a king that was coming into town, they would make huge preparations for the king to come. They would fill in the valleys. They would move the debris to make sure that there was nothing obstructing the king from coming into town for them to honor the king. So what a beautiful picture for us. Like, what is clogging the road in our lives and disconnecting me from connecting with the king? It's, it's preparing the way. John the Baptist is like, repent, God. Guys, there's something disconnected. As the king comes into your life, what is clogging the connection? This really hit me. What distraction has disconnected you and I from the Lord? It's kind of like Drano, you know, like the liquid Drano. You got like some hairballs and clogs in your drain, in your shower, what do you do? You take the liquid Drano, you just, you just throw that baby in. Sometimes we need some Drano in our life, at least for me. And so let's check out his, his uh, look at verse four, his food, his fashion and his food. You gotta see this. Verse four, John's clothes were woven from coarse camel hair. Awesome. Sounds like great, I'd like to have that. Wear, <laughs> try that. He wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. People from Jerusalem and from all of Judea and all over the Jordan Valley went out to see and hear John. I mean, it's just a revival. People from all over the place. By the way, if I'm a revivalist or if I'm like a church planner, I'm probably not gonna just go out to the desert in the middle of the wilderness to post up shop. He bucks all that. Why? He's a rebel, but he's got a cause. So they all come out to see and to hear John. In verse six, this hit me, when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. I just love this holy hippie, this, this organic vegan, this simple guy. 
I, I love how he just brings it. The Bible said that he would come in the spirit of Elijah. He, I think that he probably read the Old Testament and saw, if you studied the life of Elijah, in 2 Kings chapter one, it actually talks about Elijah was a hairy man that wore a leather belt. I'm just picturing like John the Baptist, like, yo, I, that's, that's me. And he rolls out and he's sharing this message. But I, I love what people are doing. They're confessing their sin. I think that we've lost in our culture the, the great spiritual discipline of confession. I really believe that. I think, I think in, my, in my opinion, if the church, and I'll just say love church, if we can grow in humility and confession and transparency in these days, I think we're gonna grow. We're gonna see more of the Lord in 24. I really believe that. First, number one, confessing our sins to Jesus. First John 1, 9, it says, if we, confess, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us, and what? And to cleanse us, to unclog us for all, from all unrighteousness. But then it goes a step further in James 5, 16, and this is, my small group doesn't even know that we're doing this, so if you're here and you're in my group, this is about what we're gonna do. Confess to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. You want healing in 2024? You got that thing that's just disconnected, that sin that you're like, bro, I just can't get over this. Get in a group and get real. And I promise you, and by the way, if people in the group judge you <laughs> for being real, let me know. <laughs> and I'll get real. I want a real church. I heard this, I heard this from this, this, this pastor recently. It was so good. He said when they show up to the group, he's got four guys. They, they talk about what's feeding their soul. Who are they feeding? Who are they investing in? And how are they feeding their flesh? I love that. And you know what? The, after they share, the guy next to them puts their hand on them and prays for them that they be healed. You're looking at something you shouldn't. You've said something you shouldn't. Something's off in your life. Okay, don't hide it. Bring it. I think we need to stop polishing our halos and actually bring in something real to the Lord and to each other. And I'm speaking to myself as I share this. Because sometimes if I'm honest, I don't want to be too honest with you because then you'll be like, now that's my pastor. I can't listen to that guy anymore because he's really, he's a human. Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 and more yes. Okay, let's get to some points here. Y'all point people, you're like, get to the point. Write it down. Number one, lips and lifestyle. Johnny the Baptist is gonna bring it real. He's in uncomfortable clothing, and he's gonna bring an uncomfortable message. You guys ready for it? Here it is. It's not Todd, this is God through Johnny. Here's what he's saying. Because in verse seven, these religious leaders show up, these Pharisees and Sadducees. You're gonna see them throughout this book. Basically, the Pharisees were the legalists. The Sadducees were like these liberalists, if you will. They didn't, they didn't believe in the resurrection. And so these, 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 these Jewish leaders were showing up. And this is what John the Baptist says to them in verse eight. He says, prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. And this hit me like a ton of bricks, man. <laughs> Verse nine, don't just say. Lips, don't just say to each other, oh, dude, we're safe. We're descendants of Abraham. They'd be like us saying, I'm good. I go to church every now and again. Or my parents do. I kind of grew up in church. <laughs> John's like, no, nah, that's not, that's not what we're talking about here. He said, in fact, he says, that means nothing. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. And then 10, even now, the ax of God's judgment is poised, ready to sever the roots of the trees. Yes, every tree that does not produce good fruit will be chopped down and thrown into the fire. <laughs> oh my goodness. Someone say bad root? Bad fruit. <laughs> oh, 
I like what he says. He says, prove by the way you live, that's lifestyle. Don't just say, which is lips. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I, I'm in a place where I'm saying the right thing, but it's not lining up with my actions. There, there's a disconnect between my lips and my lifestyle. It's separated. And, and the, one of the biggest tragedies of that, actually, is a lot of your friends and your neighbors and your coworkers, they'll never open a Bible. You're the Bible they're reading. I'm the Bible they're reading. So if I'm like, yeah, I'm a Christian, but then I show up late to work and I'm lazy and I'm, and I'm arrogant and I'm mean, they're gonna be like, yo, if that's what Christianity is, But when, when our lips and lifestyle start connecting, even when you blow it, if you just go to that coworker and be like, yo, I raised my voice to you. That is dishonoring to God and to you. Will you forgive me? I'm telling you, something changes right there. They're like, oh, maybe there is something about this whole Christianity thing. Lips and lifestyle. The Greek word for um, repentance, by the way, is mentanoia, and it it literally means to change your mind. And I, and I was thinking about this change of mind, change of belief is change of behavior. Why is this so key? It's, it's, I started off in life kind of doing my own thing. I'm the chief of my own world, but I came to this place of recognizing, no, there is a king. He's sovereign. I'm not. I'm gonna submit my entire life to him He's the creator, and this is gonna be a journey of change. I'm gonna change my mind on who I'm submitting to, who gives me life plans, who gives me life direction, and it's a change, and it's a constant repentance. It's a constant changing of mind, and when I see something that's disconnected from my lips and my lifestyle, I humbly submit, and I go, God, that's not lining up. Will you forgive me, and will you give me power to change? Will you give me practical ways where I could change? What is that? That is repentance. It's I'm walking this way. I recognize it. God, give me the grace to turn. It's metanoia. It's, it's changing my mind. I like these quotes. There's, there's a quote from J.R. Miller. This is what he says. True repentance, <laughs> this is wild, amounts to nothing whatsoever if it produces only a few tears, a spasm of regret, a little fright. We must leave the sins we repent of and walk in the new, clean ways of holiness. And then Johnny Corson, one of my favorite gangsters, Bible teachers, listen to what he says. If your repentance is sincere, fruit will be produced in your life. Someone say, good root, good fruit. Just let me ask you some real questions. I'm gonna ask myself this. Because when I think about fruit, the number one fruit of the spirit is what, church? Love, there it is. The fruit of the spirit as I'm connected. That's why this church has got the L. It's love God supremely so he can love people supernaturally. So when I'm connected, what is the number one fruit? It's love. So let me ask you this. Your coworkers, if I went and just surveyed your coworkers, your family members, and your neighbors, and I'm like, hey, tell me a little about, you know, so and so, Phil. <laughs> it's just Phil's study today, sorry. Okay, uh, Will, Phil and Will. If I go, hey, let me just, can I just go survey? Can you tell me a little bit about them? You know, yeah, I'm just gonna tell you, they are so loving, man. Like, even when I blow it, I mean, they'll still be real with me, but they're, man. They're kind, they're humble. When they blow it, they admit it. Can you imagine a church where the lips and the lifestyle are so connected that the world outside that is yet to be connected to God looks at your life and my life and goes, that's attractive. The fruit of the spirit, love, Joy, how about you walk into work tomorrow? I'm gonna to challenge everybody on this. Get in your Bible first thing. Maybe listen to a worship song on the way to work. And when you first get there, 
I, I guess no one goes to work. You guys are remote. But when you get on Zoom, okay? How about this? Just show up and smile. Who, who knows? Maybe, maybe a smile can save the soul of the coworker that's depressed and wondering why they should still live right now. Fruit, 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 fruit. All right, let's go to number two. He gets into baptism and burning. You can write that down. Baptism and burning. I need both. Chapter three, verse 11. I baptize with water, this is John the Baptist speaking, those who repent of their sins and turn to God. But someone is coming soon who's greater than I am, so much greater. I'm not worthy even to be a slave and carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So you got John the Baptist, a baptism of repentance with water. You got Jesus with a baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. I feel the fire over there to my left over here, okay. <laughs> Verse 12, watch this. He's ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his winnowing fork. Then he'll clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn, but burning the chaff with never-ending fire. And you're like, what in the world does that all mean? I'm gonna tell you about it here in a second. Clear it up. But let's first talk about one of my favorite things about Johnny the Baptist is his humility. This, this hippie was holy and he was humble. You got, put yourself in his shoes real quick, okay? He's sovereignly created by God to be the forerunner of Jesus himself. He rolls into the wilderness and masses of people are coming to hear him speak. And if he wasn't tight in his identity, y'all, I'm telling you, you see all kinds of preachers start getting filled with themselves and loving the attention because of their insecurity and wanting their attention. One of my favorite things about John the Baptist, what does he do? He completely points people, everybody that's coming, right to Jesus. And I would encourage all of us as Christians, man, <laughs> if you find yourself getting a following and all that, I, I just picture it's like, John the Baptist's brand. I just see t-shirts and hats, you know, like little locusts like hanging out of his lips, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just like, yo. The dude could have blew up with his social media and his brand, and guess what? All he does is point people to Jesus. In fact, one of my favorite verses, we're gonna go in John chapter three, verse 30. Listen to this. Talk, he's, he's talking about Jesus. He says, Jesus, he must what, church? Increase, but I must. Oh, that's so good. He must increase. I must decrease. He said, I'm not even worthy to carry the guy's sandals, pointing people to Jesus. Baptism. Baptism and burning. Baptism, as we know, is an outward proclamation of an inward transformation. And as people were coming and repenting and confessing their sins, this baptism was just a good picture of that, right? Like, I'm gonna do something different, I'm turning. And it was like the bat baptism of cleansing. And the Jews knew about that. I mean, really, they understood, but it was different. Before they could go and worship God in the temple, it was more of a ritualistic cleansing baptism. This was different, man. And then he says, Jesus' baptism would be with the Holy Spirit. And think about this. Uh, another word for baptism is, is um, immersion. So when Jesus would come, if you're a believer in here, you've given your life to Christ by faith, you believe that he is the son of God, the Messiah that came to save your soul, guess what? At that point of conversion, he baptizes you, immerses you in the Holy Spirit. You have the very presence of God living in you. Is that just wild or what? I mean, that, that blows my mind. But then he says this, a baptism of fire. And this is where I was like, ah, man, I need to study this. What does that mean? 
And there was, so, there was two different main ideas of, of this baptism with fire. I'll just give you a couple of them. You can do what you want with them. Number one, talking about God as an all-consuming fire. So when there's things in my life that are off, it's, it's like he, he consumes them. He burns those up. It, it'd be like, you know, if you heat up some, some metal, like some metal, like gold, and like the impurities come to the top, and then you scrape them off. Like that's the idea of kind of like this, this burning that happens of, of the dross and the chaos of our life. And as we look in that, in that beautiful metal, we see the reflection of our true self. It's just this burning away of stuff that's keeping us away from God's best. But there's also suggestion, even with the context of the burning of non-believers at the end of the day. Did you see what it said? There's this winnowing fork that will separate the chaff from the wheat. And so let me explain that. In those days, in that area, when they would harvest wheat, they would gather a bunch of wheat and there was like a winnowing fork. Imagine like a pitch, like, what do you call those things? Is it a pitchfork? Like the big, big, huge things? And they would scoop it up and they would, there would be these western, these breezes that would come from the shore. They'd throw it up and the chaff would move away and the wheat would fall down. And then they would go and they would, they would take all the, like the husk and the, and the chaff and they would burn that thing up and they would take the good stuff. That's kind of like the idea. In other words, place Jesus talks about separating the sheep from the goats, like the, the, the pretenders to the real people, the real believers. And when I was studying that, I was like, man, I don't want to mess around with that. And I don't want to be a preacher that like just tells you what you want to hear. Sometimes I got to tell you tough stuff. And if you claim to be a believer, but it's completely disconnected from your actions, I would look in the mirror and make sure that you go get with the Lord and let him deal with you. And I'm, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm saying that to myself too. There, there's times of disconnect that I can really see, man, where I'm really at. Jesus says it in Matthew 7. We're gonna be reading it here pretty soon. Let me just read this for you and for you to consider this. Okay, Matthew 7, verse 16. Talking about how we can identify kind of where we're at in this process. You can identify them by their fruit. That is, by the way they act. Back to lifestyle. Can you pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? A good tree produces good fruit. Bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So every tree that does not produce good fruit is very similar. It's chopped down and thrown into the what? Into the, into the fire, yes. Just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. You're, you and I are not saved by our good works, but it's a really good indication if we are truly saved. And so, baptism burning. Finally, number three, this is probably my favorite. And, I, I, man, this is so cool. Number three, jot it down. Adoration and affirmation. Adoration in affirmation. We saw that Johnny the Baptist was a voice in the wilderness preparing the way. But here in this, at the end of this chapter, we hear the voice from the Father in heaven adoring and affirming his son. I want you to see it. It's so good. Matthew chapter three, now verse 13. Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John. What? And this, I think it was like, I don't know, 60 miles or something. Jesus is walking to go see his cousin. By the way, I forgot to tell you that. Second cousin, John. Verse 14, but John tried to talk him out of it. I think I would too. <laughs> Wouldn't you? Like God in human flesh wants you to baptize him. No. He, he says this to Jesus. I'm the one who needs to be baptized by you, he said. So why are you coming to me? But Jesus said it should be done for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. Now here's what I want you to, there's a lot to that, but let me zone in on verse 16 and 17. Listen to this. After his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened and he saw the spirit of God 
descending like a dove and settling on him. So what do you have right there? God the Holy Spirit descending on him. And then 17, and a voice, and I would say the voice, God, from God the Father says this, from heaven said this, so you got God the Holy Spirit, you have God the Father, this is what he says, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. In another translation, it, it basically says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Why is this, this, this so significant? This is, this is what I wanna talk about. Adoration and affirmation. God the Father looks at Jesus before he does one work in ministry. This is before he does, he heals people, he preaches any messages, he cares for anybody, resurrects people. Before he does anything, God the Father looks at the Son and he's like, you know what? I'm in love with you. You are adored. I affirm you. I am well pleased by you. You are amazing. And why is this so key? Because I, if, if I could preach any other message than self-feeding, which is my main call in life, it would be identity. I truly believe with all my heart, every human is created and we, are, we need to be affirmed we need to have our identity. And here's the tragedy of what's happening in our world today. We are looking to the world, like a lot of us, we grow up, we're never affirmed or loved or accepted by our earthly parents or our peers. And so now we go out in this culture and we are trying to get accepted where anybody will accept me. And you wonder why there's school shootings. You wonder why there's gender confusion. You wonder why, why? It's identity, identity, identity. And it's even in the church, I have to preach a good message. If I'm really honest with you, I'm like, this better be good, otherwise I don't know, if, if, is God really gonna like me? Are you gonna like me? But imagine if the human race knew deep in their soul, I'm loved, I'm accepted, I'm chosen, I'm called by God the Father, and he sees me through the lens of Christ. He's well pleased. I don't have to earn his favor. I am, I am perfectly fine in my skin the way he made me. Can you imagine the freedom that would have in our culture? The workaholics trying to prove to their dad who's passed on that they are someone that would go away. Why? Because they're affirmed and adored by their heavenly father. The, the young girls showing skin and trying to have relations with different guys because they never got it in their home. Guess what? If she knew she's loved, adored, and affirmed by the father in heaven, she has no need to sell herself to actually feel like she's someone. And so something shifts in the entire world when we gain this identity, we gain this revelation. When God the Father speaks over our soul, he's like, you know what? You are loved. I'm well pleased. Paul the Apostle talks about this, and then we'll land the plane. This is so good. In Ephesians chapter one, verse four, I want you to tune in. This is so good. This is what he says. Even before he made the world, God loved us. Listen to this, Christian. You gotta hear this. Those of you that are, are struggling with your identity, you're trying to earn God's favor through actions, you gotta hear this. Even before God made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. <laughs> God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. Why? It gave him great pleasure. Golly, that's good news. I don't know where you find yourself. I, I had a real life, I'll share this story and then we'll land the plane. I, I had this, recently one of our sons is ill and we, we just had some friends over to pray for healing and, and 
as I was studying this week, God gave me this word for my son. And so I got a chance to just look at him in the eyes during this prayer meeting and look to my son and be like, can you forgive me if I've ever placed any pressure on you to perform, to play a sport, to look a certain part, to, to talk a certain way? Can you forgive me I've, if I've ever placed that upon you? I want you to know that you're loved, you're accepted. Like I, I, There's nothing that you can do or not do that would change my love for you. And I've tried to share that with our kids, man, from day one, but I'll be honest with you, man, sometimes my words and my actions may be different. And he might feel something that I don't even know is in my heart. So I had to just confess that. And I'm praying, man, that nothing will move him from his identity in Christ. Adoration, affirmation. Johnny the Baptist, what a wild dude, huh? A lot that we can learn from him. And I pray as we continue to study this, this book, and we continue to gain intimacy with Christ, he would change us. Our lips, our lifestyle would, would continue to be closer and closer together. Maybe some things need to be burned away. We know our identity. We know who we are in Christ. And we make a difference in this world. Amen? God, thank you for your word. Thank you for this church and the, the great privilege of walking with so many amazing people. Most importantly, thank you for, for you, God, not leaving us here stranded, going to the cross, paying for my sin, conquering death and hell as you rose from the grave, and now you're just reaching out to people all over the world, saying, come to me. I want to forgive you. I want to give you purpose, acceptance, affirmation. God, would you do that even today for your glory in Jesus' name?